Hey, what's up? It's Reflections of a DJ, the road podcast presented by DJ City and Beat Source. I'm your host today, Nudia. The guys are on a little Thanksgiving vacay, seeing family and friends, and we hope you are too. So in the meantime, we're bringing you another best of episode. This time, we're highlighting some of our favorite interviews on the show with guests who were not DJs. These are industry leaders in nightlife. They've come on and shared hilarious celebrity stories, given some great insider information, and just all around shared good knowledge for DJs to know. This is the Best of the Road podcast, volume three, Inside the Industry. Kicking it off, we head to episode 118, where the crew sat down with one of the pioneers in New York City nightlife, Bill Spector. The fellas asked him about an infamous incident that happened with P. Diddy at one of his parties at Mac Daddy's, and he explains how the whole situation went down. What happened at one of your parties, Mac Daddy's? It was supposed to be a, a huge party, right? That was like the, was going to be like the biggest party Manhattan ever had, like a it, hip-hop party. It, it actually was. I mean, we did almost 2,000 people, 2,500 people before... There was an infamous fight. Mm-hmm. We had a half pipe in there <laughs> on stage. We had all skaters skating in there. Oh, wow. And um, we decided we wanted to do old school hip hop. Mm-hmm. Even at that time, old school hip hop? <laughs> yeah, they were playing yeah. like old back in the day jam. Stretch was like, playing and he had his. Like Schoolie D, yeah. LL Cool J, yeah, yeah. Run DMC, shit like that. What and, year was this? Um, 95, 96, okay. maybe. Yeah. And that was yeah. when we coined old school as like kind of that old school era. Yeah. I remember it was like old school was specifically 80s, mm-hmm. like hip hop. Now old school is like a whole bunch of shit. <laughs> yeah. 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 Old school now. <laughs> but like in the 90s, we would say old school was like audio too and all. Like that was old yeah. school. And exactly. Shit like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then what was this fight? Can, can you go into it a little bit or no? Well, I'll go into it. I mean, you know, everybody's. <laughs> From what I heard, it was like Puff Daddy. It was kind of puff, then, it was kind that, of puffy versus the world at and that the ta- point. This tattoo artist named Renee. Yes, Renee Soto. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, who was was down with the Booyah kids. He was a New York downtown kid. He, they were him and Puffy were sleeping with the same girls, and um, Puff came in with the crew. He was you know already big at that point, but he had you know worked with us. We were cool with him, you know, but he wasn't really in our scene. He was in the more hip hop scene. Our scene. He would come maybe once a month to our things. Mm-hmm. And he came and he, I guess he, he tried Renee a couple times. And that kid, Renee is the calmest kid in the world. And he just kind of walked away from the fight. Next thing I know, a fight just erupts in the club. The whole club is swaying. There's like 2,000 people in there. We had a young Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, you know, it was like just so many people. It was like, I was never into celebrities, so I didn't really know who was there. But, you know, I would hear subsequently. Yeah. Because I'm, an extrovert introvert like i can hide in the corner or mm-hmm. be as be this social at the same time it, it's it depends in my mood like i'm happy never to like speak just sit there and like look into space <laughs> <laughs> as i know what's going on i for you <laughs> and um this fight happens puffy's like it ends up puffy's on the losing side but also you know the, the downtown kids are majority there mm-hmm. puffy's there with like 6 10 people at the most mm. and Renee was there with like 200 people probably at his back. It was a one-on-one fight. Then it became a group fight. Then the skaters jump off the stage mm-hmm. and they start hitting Puffy in the head with, their, with, <laughs> with the, the, yeah, the boards. Oh, wow. And, uh, Shit. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> this is nuts. <laughs> and they hit the, somebody hits the wall. Harold Hunter hears the explosion. Rest in peace to Harold Hunter. Mm-hmm. And it makes a noise echoing in this whole club, Irving Plaza which wasn't a club, it was a concert hall. Mm -hmm. And he hits the wall like four more times. And security from the space is is union security, doesn't know anything about our club, our mentality. They won't let us bring our own security. And who knows how to handle everybody? Right, Mm -hmm. right. And all of a sudden, they're like gunshots. And now you hear 2,000 people charging towards two doors. Mm -hmm. As we get outside, another person that... You know, Puff starts screaming at somebody. He's, like, already been beat up. Like, you know, he lost on the losing end. And he starts screaming at somebody from downtown, and they jump him again. Jeez. Wow. <laughs> the next day, I get phone calls from, like, their camp, from the bad boy camp, from Jessica. We need to get a hold of these Booyah kids. Give us Renee's number. <laughs> and I'm like, I call Renee up, and I'm like, Renee, they want your number. He goes, mm-hmm. give it to them. 
Oh wow! Oh, <laughs> shit! <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> round three, <laughs> fight! They, oh, shit. they contact him. He he already has the Booyah kids in town that next day. They went and met with Puffy. Everything was squash. Yeah. Wow, man! I didn't know all that. The one wow. thing, the one thing I will say about Puffy in fights, he definitely handles very, very well, even on the defeat side. Not not in a good way or a bad way. He's obviously a good business guy. I've seen a lot of like. He's been in multiple altercations, and he figures it out, out at the end mm-hmm. where to make it amenable to everybody. Not monetarily, but like, you know, where there's where, you know, you can go forward where he's going to show up again mm-hmm. or they're going to show up again and yeah. everybody's not going to be shooting at each other. Oh, man. He, Damn, def- <laughs> he yeah, definitely is, he <laughs> definitely is a astute businessman on multitude of levels. Yeah. At that time with the. With like Puffy and before when he before he was a uh, with Bad Boy he was a promoter and all of these up he was and, yeah. where he was with Jessica you know mm-hmm. and oh, he did yeah. he did a bunch of stuff with us she she did a party with him Daddy's house mm-hmm. where she kind of gave him his clout wow yeah he was amazing he knew every girl he was driven he he told me something in 1990 and you know he told me one day he goes look at me and we were always close and he goes. I'm be the richest N you ever met in the world. And he goes, you know what I'm saying? And I looked at him. I was like, okay. And he goes, no, no, I'm dead serious. <laughs> so I always look at him. And when we have a conversation, I go, I remember that time you told me that. You're pretty close. Wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like watching him and his, his come up and, and Bad Boy Era, Craig Mack and Biggie Smalls, even right before when he was at Uptown mm-hmm. with Mary J. Blige. All, were all those artists just totally involved with the parties? They were always out. Well, and Mary J came a little bit. Um, Big, we had some. We didn't let him in because he brought in too much of a, a mm. Brooklyn posse. We yep. did let him in. We didn't let him in. Andre Harrell was always in. Russell came. You know, they liked at that point. They liked much more the bougie shit than our shit. But they still came to our thing because they would see what's bubbling with the kids five, ten years younger than them. Mm-hmm. But it was definitely the era of like Puff and Jay and. Q-Tip would come to the parties. I knew him from Queens. You know, we would, and he, and we always were close. And then, you know, the Daylock kids were around, the Jungle Brothers. Wow. Mm-hmm. And all them, you That's know, so they, they performed all the time. Like, I, I take for granted that you could get a performance out of somebody for, for free or for on the strength or pushing their album. Like, it made no sense. Like, later on, like, as I was doing parties in the 2000s or, now and an artist tells me I want fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. I was like, huh? people don't do that for free." <laughs> like in a very naive sort of yeah. way, not in a mean sort of way. Like I'm getting over. Did you know how special it was though? Like not how, a clue. No, no. It was just like they were just homies, and you were just like, or just it was just it. that. Yeah, we were just living it. We didn't understand how great right. we had it until one day it was all gone. <sighs> so like, crazy. I mean, not really cap at your parties, nuts, man. Right I before should... Titanic, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Did you ever have like? A, Maybe a real memorable night, an epic night of a performance that you'll never forget. I mean, so many of them were just yeah. like where you'd have like six of them, like the greatest ha- rappers of that point, just be on stage, and you'd just be like, "How did this just happen?" Yeah, <laughs> because there was no threatening the sound guy. There was like it was like because I would see all that, like when I would go to concerts of those, you know, like, and they would like be beefing with people and, and in our parties they would just be getting on the mic whether it was choppy or great and and even sometimes when the DJs would be annoyed, they'd be like, dude, get these guys off. Right, right. And I think back now and I'm like, get them off ever? <laughs> <laughs> so like when when that happened, like they'd be at home like let's say, I don't know, Tribe would be there. And they'd be like, yo, was it like we're gonna drop an album? Can we just like jump on or can we push more, this more up? like we are dropping an album and we, we're gonna get on and yeah, do yeah. three we're songs <laughs> and then from your perspective you're like oh cool like just yeah that, that. truth be told stretch handled a lot of that yeah. or when we used clark kent you know a lot of them dealt with that mm-hmm. i was dealing with the drama at the door the money mm-hmm. and um dealing with fragile people's egos not not performers like you know people i waited outside for 20 minutes like say a puffy or you know any or even a drug dealer that that feelings were hurt. Why my boy stuck outside? Like, mm-hmm. and I'll be like, uh, let me figure this out. Let me go outside, pop my head out, get threatened by fifty people, <laughs> pop my head back in. 
And and like supermodels and models were always at these parties, pretty they, much. They came all the time. They were very interested in what we were doing. You know, we were interested in them. Yeah, yeah, of course. Because I I remember I think I came up like when I was started when some of the clubs were actually letting me in and it was like I was actually able to see some of this shit. Mm-hmm. Was like the Rockefeller era, and I I started seeing like these like you know Sports Illustrated supermodels hanging out with like Rockefeller and then to be like Aaliyah. It was like such a weird and then Mark Ronson would be DJing and yes. I'm like, yo, this is like the most eclectic room of like just like artistic creative people. Well he was know? the second coming for us. Like yeah. after Stretch he came and he was he had a band called the Whole Earth Mamas and he was like, Let me DJ, let me open, let me open and I was doing a party at the Grand called True. And he was like, come on, let me open. And I was like, he was like, I can bring people from uptown. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest that I was a little skeptical because he really wasn't in the vein of like where we were. Mm -hmm. And he opened and he was good, even though he was hated on by a lot of the older DJs. Really, really, really hated on. Mm -hmm. Why They were hating on him because they just felt like he came from. They they wanted to do the party. Yeah. (laughs) And they also, you know, thought that I was hiring him because he's a pretty kid. But he he's musical thing you know he really came up quick and he brought people and he was amazing and he actually was really good for us and always stayed the same person you know minus a couple little nuances you know (laughs) did he try to like hide his british accent i used to hear that all the time with mark he never had it and i'm back in the days i never noticed it somebody (laughs) asked him about it when i was with them personally and he and which may be true listen he his Roman Jones, who's his half brother, has one. Mm-hmm. His parents. Roman Jones. Uh, yes, his half stepbrother. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow. And um, I didn't know that. <laughs> they have it. His parents have it. Mm-hmm. And he was like, I just suppressed it a lot more. And then as I started sit- sitting with these people, I was like, it came out. So listen, that could be true, and I, all good. But I can say one thing. Now he still takes the phone call, the email, mm-hmm. the text. Come hang out. He's pretty much to He's- me. I mean, I haven't done any business with him. The same person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Looks a little different. Right. <laughs> but acts the same. If you were to make a list of people that have been mentioned the most on this podcast, scam artist owner Sujit would probably be on the top of that list. And in episode 92, the guy sat down with him and Sujit got really candid and shared his thoughts on big DJs leaving scam like Vice and Rocticon. Has there ever been a time, like, honestly, like, if I left, I know you'd be heartbroken and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Right. Truth, truth be told, when anyone, whenever any time someone leaves, right, like, I, like, I kind of, like, there's been times when I've been disappointed that people have left yeah. because I felt like I've done a great job. Yeah. And there's been other times when people have left because, you know, like, I don't kick people off, but the truth be told... You know, my attorney told me once, he was like, at the end of the year, he looks at his roster, his clients. Mm-hmm. And the ones that make him money stay, right? The ones that don't make him money. Leave. If they don't, if they don't cause him grief, right? If they don't make him money, but they don't really bother him, they stay, right? The ones that don't make him money, he thinks about how much time he has to spend not making money, right? So there's often there's DJs that are on the lower tier of the financial earning, yeah. right? That, bu- that, that drain me. Right? And when they say they want to leave, I'm like, listen, leave. I'll even might ask them, you know what, dude, if you're unhappy, you should just leave, right? Yeah. Like, I'm good. And they're like, why are you saying that? Why are you saying that? And I'm like, bro, because the amount of, the, you're asking me to sit on the phone with you for an hour and I probably make no money. Like, you're, you're stressing me out, bro. Just like, I'd rather just be your friend. Like, just bounce, bro. Like, you said some real ass <laughs> shit to some DJs, though. Bro, I'm just telling you, like, like, like. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 no, but no, you don't understand. In the middle of my day, people want to have a conversation for an hour about their calendar, and I'm like, bro, like, like, if if you believe that I'm gonna stop my day and I'm gonna start working on your calendar for four hours, and you're averaging five, seven hundred dollars a night, you are playing yourself. I'm not gonna do it, mm-hmm. right? You are playing yourself, right? Can someone in my office sign? Can you do? If you're at that end of the tier, you need to hustle for yourself, and I'll help you. And maybe out of four gigs or five gigs, I might find one or two that I can slide you. Yeah. But you're going to have to do the bulk of the heavy lifting. And if not, bounce. Yeah. Like, I'm not making any money here. <laughs> I'm, them to bounce. I'm good. Like, we'll be good. I right, just do me a favor. Stop telling some of these DJs to drive Ubers, yo. No, That's I didn't up. say that. I, yeah, yeah. I've heard about, I've that, heard one, about that one, too, bro. I was like, damn. No, bro. Oh, man, no, look, look, let, let's, <laughs> let, here, let, here, here. Let me, let me tell you like this. Let me tell you like this. I'll tell you like this. If I, as a ind- human being, right, 
needed work, okay? And I wanted the flexibility of being able to take gigs where I could or where I couldn't. Like, as a promoter, I, like, you know, I was investing my own money. And oftentimes when I would get to the party, a break even would be a win for me, right? Mm-hmm. Because I would just want to break even. And then I realized after doing, after spending 500 hours and throwing a party that a break even was my alternative, I sat down and I was like, shit, if I worked at McDonald's, for those same 500 hours at the end of the 500 dollars i'd have money in my pocket yeah, yeah right so what i'm saying is is that if if djing isn't working out for you right you may need to find some sort of part-time job to supplement it so you're not putting the pressure on the fact of if you don't get three gigs a month your lights are going to go off that's not a suit like you got to look at yourself on that right like you're talking to a guy who has two full-time jobs so i'm not telling you something that i wouldn't do but you can't like Again, you can't sit at home and feel sorry for yourself. So, you know, it, it, it's a tough position because, you know, be, just because you were DJing once for $2,500 a night and that was your thing is that now you don't want to be a waiter at a restaurant. But you got bills to pay. You got commitments to deal with. And you got to figure that out on your own. That's not that's not I didn't sign up for that. Right? Like I didn't I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> yo, but you can't tell motherfuckers like, yo, man, go drive an Uber, man. Like, uh, it's a good money. it's a good job. You can do it when you want. <laughs> 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 it's on your own terms. It's, it's on your own, own terms. You Crazy. go do it when you want. You do it when you don't want. Like that's fucking nuts. Man. I, no, no, but I've said other things. Go get a job as a manager. Go get a job as a real estate. Go get a job. Go get a job, dude. Like yeah. it's it's like if, if it's not working for you, like and this is this is going to be a part time proposition. Mm-hmm. You have to like as your agent or whatever. I'm giving you the solid advice that like I'm not probably going to be able to help you that much more. So you might need to find an alternative and what yeah. that alternative is for you or isn't that's on you when when rock the con kind of like took a break and like kind of left djing for a little bit and you guys were like a really dope team like you guys were like, like killing the game for a minute was there a part of you that was like damn like i i mean he was great he was crushing it i mean yeah. we i no because you know what at the end of the day i'm supportive of people and I like he like look had he left me for another agency, yeah. Then I would have been bummed out because I thought I was doing everything for him. Right, right. I was providing resources to him. We had a rhythm. We were doing great. Had he left me for another agency, I think that would have been a bummer. He left me for a life change, and for that, I have nothing but respect. Right, mm-hmm. like so. And then when he did decide to come back to DJing, his first call was to me. Yeah, I was just at a different place in my life, and he was at a different place in his life, and he needed to do what he needs to do for him. And mm-hmm. for that, I there's no. Like when I see him, it's all love. Like, like I don't think that there's anything iffy or shady about that. There's been people that I've I've looked at their calendars and they've been winners, and then I've watched them leave me and then they've turned into not as good or yeah. different. And them, I'm like, I'm like, bro, like, really? Or like sometimes I've been like, if there is, I feel like if some, there's a lot of people that I've advanced money to for no interest, right, mm-hmm. and not even made them pay it back to me in like over a, a fair amount yeah. of time. I've done people IRS liens. I mean, you, you. I, mean, I went through a, a tax, like a, yeah, a huge. I wasn't saying you because I, I don't remember, but I dealt with people's no, no, IRS like, liens. I, 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 at some point, like a, maybe ten years ago, or like I, I went through like a a bad IRS thing, and you lent me five Gs. And exactly. You didn't, you, you, you didn't even ask. You were just like, when you need it, I send it tonight. I send it today. Exactly. And it was in my bank, you know, the next day, you so, know. So I've done things for people. I've child support, tax liens. I don't even remember that, but good to know all no, that. No, <laughs> no, that, shit, that shit. Because at the time, I'm like, God, this motherfucker's such an asshole, man. Like, sometimes he's so brash. And then I was like, yo, man, I might need, like, a, a do you think you could, like, you know, front me some money? Like, without a question, I got you. Gotcha. And I was like, oh, shit. He was mad cool about that. And I sent it probably the next day or the na- that night. I was like, yo, yeah. send it right now. I sent an email. It'll go. But that's the thing is, like, I've done for people a lot. And then when, like, in some instances where if it's not going the right way, rather than the first call be I'm leaving, the first call, you know, uh, uh, I'll say it, Sid Vicious, right? Yeah. You know, the way he left Scam is almost the perfect way to do it, right? Like, he, we met so many times about how to fix it and how to fix it. And I tried so hard to fix it, but I just couldn't fix it. So when he finally left, I didn't feel like he was leaving me. I felt like I had been given every opportunity to do what I could for him. Right. And I just couldn't do for him anymore. So his decision to leave me or t- for us to stop working together, there was no ever like, 
what a dick this guy fucked like i took it like he was he was more than gracious with how he handled me and so for that i was very respectful of and like you know if i see him like you know and again he's in a different place in his life mm -hmm. he's married he's a different guy now so like you just got it's just, i just feel like it's how you handle the situation right right did you i mean you had to like there was so much history with you and vice and when he when he uh when he left scam i mean like that must have like like it must have been, you know, it must have hurt you more personally. I'm, 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 more, I'm really curious about that. Well, like, I kind of knew it was coming like three or four years before, mm -hmm. just because we were growing apart, right? So I don't. So personally, or business wise, I mean, no, no per, probably personally, person, right? Not, yeah. not, I think like I think that like you know, my where his life was heading, and where my life was maintaining were different yeah right like you know like i think he you know he was getting married he had a kid like his we were going in different directions right so yeah. we weren't as like our our um you know our day-to-days weren't the same anymore so i kind of your worlds weren't as aligned as aligned yeah. right so i felt like we were so it wasn't but you know when he finally told me i was totally blindsided it was like i was like bro seriously and i and and i truly believe the last two or three years of his career were probably his best. And I don't think that he's maintained that level since he's left me. The last two, three years with, with, with scam, scam. With scam yeah. I, were probably his, his best years. Yeah. And I think that he probably, you know, I, I think that he should, we should have had, we should have had a different conversation before it ended there. You wanted that Sid Vicious conversation where like, let's work this out. Let's see what's going wrong. Let's Try and what's going on? Right. Let's let's try to remedy this right before just like cutting right cutting the hand. We never off, had right? that conversation, yeah. mm. so I feel like I feel like for for having that much tenure and having that much things, if he had some things that he was unhappy with, it almost came out of nowhere for you. Then it was like no, I mean I could sit, I could yeah, yeah. I could sit, look at I could sense that we weren't like that was a, when he when we were rolling. It's kind of like what you said with Little John, right? You're saying if yeah. I if I if there was a a, let's say a five thousand dollar opportunity like what i need to run that by him no because we have such a rhythm right now yeah that, that i we're almost moving in unison right? Mm -hmm. right and so there's if the djs that are that are kind of crushing it we're moving in unison we're in cahoots right, right. Yeah. so so there was a point maybe three or four years ago where i felt like we were no longer in cahoots i kind of knew at the end was kinda, he got a manager like that was the first sign. I was like, and I wasn't included in the conversation. Mm. Yeah. So that was a good indicator that, you know, if we were if we were on the same wavelength, I would have been involved in that decision right. or that decision making process, right? Yeah. So you know, like I, I I could sense that we were heading down the wrong path, but the final blow of like leaving, he didn't. And he never came to me and said, "Hey, look, it, I'm unhappy here." Like, you got a six-month clock. This is what I'm looking for. If we can't remedy this, I'm going to start looking somewhere else. I feel like that far into that relationship, I was in, I'm entitled to that. And I didn't get that. Mm -hmm. And I was told at, like, a bar after we took a shot. Like, it wasn't even, like, a real meeting. That's like, like I was I, hanging out. When he yeah, he was like, yo, you around? Can we catch up? And I was like, yeah, cool. I'm over here drinking with some friends. And he came over. And then he was like, yo, I need to talk to you. We went to the bar. And he was like, yo. And I was like, I, was, I already had two shots. I was kind of like, fuck you, bro. Like. <laughs> 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 damn but i mean that's my man it's all love yeah. like look we had a great run together i'm happy you know i like yeah. i feel like i came out of this in a, in a in a solid position and it's it's funny it's like you know i i always remember that entourage episode right where um where the guy was like you want to come to a big firm so if one you know of your if your big client leaves you you're still afloat right so i you know Maybe five or six years before that, I had always wanted to build scams. So if a vice left, it wouldn't cripple the company. Right. Right. So if, um, uh, you know, heaven forbid, a big client leaves, the company still exists. I'm not mm -hmm. having to lay people off or to make changes like, you know, like I, it didn't the company didn't miss a beat. Right. right. So. So. And, and, and a, a lot of other like a. Uh, uh, DJ started to emerge, you know, like the LA Leaker started to emerge. Right. Just Incredible, Sour Milk, right. and then even Fade, Five even and Eric Deluxe. Deluxe. Yeah. Yeah, everyone started kind of coming up, you know. Exactly. So, like, it, it kind of like, yeah, it, it almost organically happened. If you want to hear hip hop music in Las Vegas, 
everyone will tell you Dre's is the place to go. And in episode 56, the guys had Constantine on, who was the head of entertainment for Dre's management group. And he talked about creating the Dre's format and being one of the first to bring a more concert-like atmosphere to the nightclub. Vegas, every nightclub in Vegas was frightened of hip-hop. Right, very, very scary. Yeah, I remember we, I, we were doing Ling, I would DJ yeah. Ling Ling Room, and then he, uh, Constantine, you would text me, and you'd be like, "Yo, we got a special guest, but we can't announce it because yeah. who?" Now I want to get to the bottom of this a little bit, but he would, Constantine would be like, "Yo, we can't announce it. It's gonna be Mob Deep," but he's like, "Damn, we can't announce it because the city's gonna shut us down." Or some shit like you would say, like, we're going to get in well, trouble. Well, it wasn't me that said that, but I think I, I understand the story you're referring to. Yeah, someone's like, listen, I, I think. What is know, that? Who's shutting you guys down and I, how does that work? Well, no one's doing anything. Uh, I, I think <laughs> I think the, I think the, the, the honest way to look at it is that, you know, you have, like we said, billion dollar nightclub brands, big businesses, yeah, yeah, yeah. lots of money. And obviously there's been a kind of cautious step to embrace hip hop, mm -hmm. you know, across the yeah. board, especially in Vegas. And, you know, uh, I think sometimes people have been careful how to market their brand and align them with certain artists. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, whether it's like, and, and listen, let, let's be honest, right. It, it, there are certain artists that appeal to, you know, some, some MCs only talk about dope, right. Yeah. Or some only talk about girls or, you know, Common is talking about, you know, some introspective shit or whatever right, right, it is, right? right? So, like... And so you got dudes like YG where everything's gang life. Right. right. So, not that there's right or wrong with that or whatever, right. but the, the people who are going to be, uh, 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 you know, buy those CDs or listen to that music exactly. might be, you know, in, 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 one, in one sector. So, I, I think, you know... Uh, maybe that's the, the 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 nice way to explain how, how why people yeah, have been no. cautious, yeah. and I don't know if I'm you know saying that appropriately. You know, for me, I just I've never been involved in the nightlife business because of like girls or party or you know all those things. Kind of, I just had to get you know manage well to to stay there. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's always just been about you know this kind of. Uh, you know, how enamored I am with just music and what it does to people and everything. Right. And, you know, when I came to Vegas and, you know, I, I was in Park City, so we would do cool things, but it wasn't because we were paying a lot of money. It just random mm -hmm. shit that we got lucky to get done. In Vegas, you know, people making, you know, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a night. In my head, there's a lot of things you can do with that, you right. know. And, 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 you know, the cool thing about Sundance is, you know, we did... Uh, uh, you know Metallica and then we did Nas and NERD two nights later you know what I mean yeah, so yeah. like yeah. We, we, we it was never about one kind of music it was about putting a live music experience within like, a night it was like a variety show bro. yeah like it was a it, musical variety show that you guys did it was cool yeah. it was special yeah. you know it was an I mean? indoor festival <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly it was it was kind of before there was all these festivals yeah. going on it was like a Super festival random, bro yeah. We yeah, Metallica the nerd I mean NERD yeah. to yeah. wherever he's just said fuck yeah the Metallica shit was nuts just yeah love that happened but so then you got like guys like Jamie here who's just starting. He's like a rookie DJ. He's just coming onto the scene. He's like originally a sneakerhead. Right. But like, he's like, who the, f you know, who's Constantine? He's like, what is this? Because you hear all about? Constantine, Constantine. I'm like, well, what is Let this? me put a face yeah, to yeah. this guy. So he's asking me all these stuff's true. He's asking me all these questions. I'm like, yo, don't worry. Don't, like, you, you're going to find out. But like, what you were just, what you were just um, talking about at Hakkasan and coming into Dre's and how it all aligned a little bit. Yeah. You need someone with balls. Hundred percent to, to follow through with all of your ideas or suggestions because, 100%. like I said, everyone was so scared of hip hop. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And also at the time, and EDM was kind of big, right? It was oh, huge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it it had been at its peak for a little bit, but it 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 was ever. That's all everybody were, yeah. you know. Because again, yeah. Yeah. when when there's so much on the line, a lot of people are like, "Well, sh this works. Let's not mess it up. Let's right. just try and do it our way." Don't fuck up a good thing, right? And so you know, again, for me, it's like you're making money, but it was just like it, there was no like creative fulfillment, mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of where you know my my brain set was coming from. Uh, and then also, you know, I, obviously, I, I like hip hop music a little bit more. I think, but also yeah. like, I mean, <laughs> let's not lie. I mean, when Dre's first opened, you guys were doing, you guys were pushing EDM acts on the, on the weekends, and I think you had. <laughs> Right. Like you had like a hip hop Sunday or something yeah, that like was that, it, right? right? Yeah, it, it was. It's been a long road to get from there to here. So you know when I but it was a gradual thing because like um I want to say like all the big EDM acts were kind of already taken. Correct. So then when you guys would try to sign EDM acts, they were still like I guess well known DJs. 
but they just weren't that big as like a Calvin Harris or Tiesto. You right. know what I mean? Like, who did right. you have? Still, you had Sidney Sampson. Yeah. Uh, um, great DJ. Yeah, I, yeah. I want to know who the EDM when, guys are. When I first you. got there uh, and, and uh, you know, a lot of things that were already moving, right? So I got to Dre's about six months after they opened. I think I got there in July. Or not even that. They opened in May. I got there in July mm-hmm. of that year. Yeah. And uh, I think we had, you know, Mac J, Blau. Yeah. You know, the thing yeah. is, is if you go look at all the DJs throughout Vegas, not at Dre's now, but, you know, some of them are still there. Um, but all of them kind of blew up there and then evolved and got gigs at other places. Sometimes some of them continue going and some kind of plateaued. But at the time, that was the your Borges, the first time he was in Vegas, was at Dre's, Blau, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, Mac J. You mentioned Sidney Sampson. Kind of like the new like trap like, EDM. Like, maybe Correct. Like all the trap EDM DJs. Right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think the, the problem is, especially that time with the climate with the DJs, is like, you know, Tiesto and Calvin worked all the time. Uh, Everything else didn't, right? So, right. and the difference between Dre's and every other club is, you know, the Cromwell's a 180 hotel room uh, property. It's the only boutique hotel on the strip. So, unlike MGM or The Win or, you know, Cosmo, there's, you know, we don't have two, three thousand, four thousand rooms. We have 188. So, everything up There's only 188? That's it. So, know that. you know, you have Flamingo and Caesars, but those still off property. You still have to leave that property to come. So, yeah. w- w- you know, what we all realize fast is, you know, there, there was nice momentum because it was a new club, but in order for us to really get people there, there we had to bring them. Yeah. They yeah. didn't just stay there and come. There's and so, no walk. Yeah. There's no traffic. There's no. no walking traffic. You're like a destination right. location. Right. right. So, you know, every whole, every club in town, you know, you inherit a certain crowd or you mark to that crowd. You know, we, we kind of have to drive a big portion of the people that but come. But it's also like a nightclub's identity gets a little watered down, though. When, Correct. It went, like when Dre's has EDM and then every club has EDM, but you don't have Calvin Harris or Tiesto or, or Steve Aoki. You just kind of look like everybody else. Like a bad just, version of everything. Yeah, you're like kind of yeah, like Correct. a like a bad version. And, like, and, you know? and and I think that's I think that's kind of where you know you say the stars aligned. I, you know, obviously I, I'm this guy that you know had a kind of niche expertise, and then I had a passion for for hip hop music and the culture. You know, to me, I that's where I got the gratification on like showing the compelling difference between a Nas show or mm-hmm. you know what I mean, a Future show and you know, uh, Afrojack show, you know, not yeah. that, uh, you know, that's not cool, but just there's a very big difference between, you know, somebody in a DJ booth jumping and a guy performing, engaging, you're so close, you can feel a sweat. And, you know, he's actually, you know, singing or rapping the lyrics, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, it, I, I really was excited about that. I think where it goes to, you got to have a guy with balls or you got to have the right people that are, you know, you can pitch somebody a lot of things, but you know, will they help you do it? Will they fall through? Will they stand behind you when it's tough? And I think that's where, you know, uh, Victor Dre, before I ever spoke to him and to this day and along the process, he definitely, you know, is a principle-based person. So separate from, well, gosh, even though I'm spending a lot of money, I'm making money, in his head, he felt, well, if I'm going to spend this much money, I want something more, you know? I want right. I yeah. want to be different. I don't mind spending the money, but it has to be different. So I think... You know, him already having that mentality and, you know, he really wanted to do something different, uh, you know, and Victor's a funny guy because, you know, if you, if, if, you know, part of a short version of the after hours story is, you know, someone threw an after hours party at his restaurant because it was a steakhouse mm-hmm. and it worked. And he's like, this is great. Let's do it every night. Right. Mm-hmm. So when, when, <laughs> when something works, he's like, great all the time. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, we had a lot of conversations. I started in July and agenda was like the good environment to you know to again to bring something in and, yeah yeah and the first first show we ever did again was nas yeah uh, uh because you know nas has kind of been one of those guys i did a show with a long time ago we yeah. you know we we had a, a very mutual connection and i've always tried to work with nas anytime i can just you know uh, like on some geek shit right so yeah. <laughs> uh you know we did nas and, Je- and jeremiah those were the first two shows we did and then we did uh, chris brown on halloween at the time mm-hmm. and we did chris we were like don't do chris what are you doing I was there for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was it was amazing. It was I mean, insane. he came, he performed for like an, an hour. hour and a half yeah. maybe mm-hmm. and you know, he I, so like I, I, my my thing is this, when you were putting these things on the table and obviously there were people in the room that were like, well, you know, everything's EDM, let's stay with EDM. How hard was it to kind of, you know, uh, especially like Victor, feed, especially with Victor Dre's. Yeah, it's uh, like how know, do you how do you feed them like a kid vegetables and like kind of make well, it like, <laughs> make it taste like cake, you know I, what I mean? Pause. I, I think I think that goes on. <laughs> I think that goes on on like minor details more, but I will say and I don't just say it's cuz it sounds right, but 
uh, to Victor's credit, uh, the minute he saw it, he was like, ah. Oh, I get it. I, so, I, I found it. It's yeah, like, yeah. This is it. And, yeah. and uh, because it, you guys stood out a lot when right. you guys started embracing hip hop. Absolutely, yeah. you guys stood out, mm-hmm. and then everybody looked like they were behind. Like yeah, they especially were like, oh, the, shit. the placement of where Dre's is at. Like you look up and you just see shit going Correct. on in hip hop music coming out. Even from like the strip, you're like, that's why. Because that's because you know, when be when at. industry motherfuckers are talking, like yo. Right. Did you see Chris Brown? Sh- Did you see like the Instagram yeah. or Chris Brown? Right. When that one, I don't know what night that was, but that was the epic that was night. The, that was the main when of I the fight I, weekend. I think I yeah. texted you or DM'd you and I said, yeah. yo, fam, you are like breaking new ground here. You, it was it pretty was, cool. It was a fight weekend, right? It was It was the, actually the Mayweather fight weekend. So so we did Chris the first time and, 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 and Dre's, uh, Victor has always been a big fan of Chris and yeah. his style, uh, good of a dancer. And Chris was awesome from the day. Because he's an insane performer, right? Listen, Chris might be the most talented human being alive. Like, he's the kind of person you could be like, hey, here's a pencil, and he'll, you know, paint a mural. Like, here's a basketball, he'll cross you over and dunk. You know, he'll rap, he'll sing, he can do a back. You know, he just is a uh, a, a dynamic person. I've never seen anybody that can do anything, right? So, right. uh you know, and, and and in the club, that's like, you know, he was the perfect combination. I think the the next big thing that kind of put us in a uh outside of just hip hop or whatever the case because even though chris is an r&b artist he's like a hip hop r&b artist to a certain degree and in some fashion i don't know but when we in, in circle back to the weekend then the next act we signed and originally the plan was to do it once a month yeah we were like let's do it once a month we kind of had a lot of commitments to the djs and then after chris victor's is like uh i want to do this every night which you know is cool but also is a little scary because right, right. all yeah. of a sudden you got to ramp that up and then we did the weekend uh on new year's uh new year's the day before new year's i think it was uh 2013 so going into 14 Mm -hmm. and at the time it was the same thing like i was like please do this you have to do this they're like i don't know it's too you know whatever we we fought finally you know some uh, other people got involved in the conversation even on the caesar side and they're like hey you know they're probably right we should do this Mm -hmm. we did it and then that first show happened and and you know one if you've been to a weekend show especially at that time you know, it's like 75% women. women. Yeah. And not just 75%, like, like the like baddest, flyest, bad, like, the, great like the girls like that. that don't go out, that, you know, need need whatever to go out. It, it, was, it was like eight to one. It was I think awesome. the first time you had week. Yeah. Yeah. So wait, you had to really fight to get weekend at Drake's. Absolutely. You know. Sounds like a movie. I, I mean, I wouldn't say, I, listen, <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't say fight, but I, listen, I, I think, you know, what we were doing was new for all of us, you yeah. know, so it, it's it's scary. Because he didn't have a single yet, really. Well, yeah, so, no, he, he had, had to, um, out, he had to join with um, so, why, I, the t- Well, no, no, I, well, yes, he had, I mean, he had those joints. He had yeah. all those joints. Uh, and at yeah. the time, yeah. often he would play often, he'd play all those songs, yeah. and he had a couple new songs. And so we did the New Year's thing, and we did a, we did a show the next week at CES with him. And they're great. I mean, you know, he's an example, I would say, that, uh, you know, what can happen if you have a guy that's dedicated, like Michael Jordan, dedicated to his craft. Because, right. you know, some guys will, uh, uh, and I don't mean it's the right or wrong way, but, you know, they're okay being a little late. They're okay, you know, maybe the show ends a little short. He's not. Like, you know, one time we made him late, and he's like, listen, we're here for them. We should never be late. You know, like, and their whole team was so thorough from day one. And I think, you know, it's an example to see, you know, look at him now. We did those first two shows. Our next show was in February. Earned It dropped after our second show. Mm-hmm. And when Earned It dropped, he was gone. It was like, we, you know, they were like, oh, we shouldn't have signed a deal. Because, right. you know, like, if we would have signed that deal a week later, one and then, week, and then he became like a mega he, fucking yeah. star. He was, yeah. he was, that was you know, the, the, the new, 50 Shades of Grey song. Yeah, 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 exactly. And then the album came out. And then, you know, yeah. after that, the beautiful man, it was like, crazy. hey, do you want to do another year? And he's like, oh, I'm doing arenas, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, Thanks, Grace. <laughs> he did come back and did a few shows for you guys, right? We did. We finished out that year. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, those guys are like family to mm-hmm. this day. And you know he's uh, he's one of the nicest, most soft spoken, you know, humble, you know, uh, uh, engaged. You know, he's just a great, normal person. And I, and randomly, you know, he's Ethiopian. I don't know if you know this, but a lot of Ethiopia know that. is uh, a Greek Orthodox. In yeah. fact, next no, to Greece, next to Greece and Russia, uh, Ethiopia has the most Greek Orthodox. Like really, pro- proportionately, it's like ninety five percent. So when we met, he's like, uh, you know. You're Greek, because my my name's a very like uh, Greek Orthodox yeah. Greek name, and he's like, actually, my 
you know, my mother's a very serious Greek Orthodox. And he's like, you know, and he told me and the whole bit. So, you know, just little random things like that kind of, you know, always help, you know, uh, maybe strengthen the relationship. But uh, it was the weekend and Chris and uh, then we had the, the, the Mayweather fight. So, yeah. And then yeah. I just want to paint the picture of the Mayweather fight. It was Chris <laughs> Brown. What May- Mayweather was this? The first one. I mean, the, the big one, the Pacquiao. Yeah, the Pacquiao. Pacquiao. So it was Chris Brown performing. Correct. And on stage was like 50 Cent. Like it was everybody. It was everybody. It was awesome. It was like, and I, I remember I told you it was, it was like the first time I saw like a hip hop rap pack. Yeah, where like everybody That's was on you like say that, yeah. yeah, Fifty Cent was on stage. There was like fabulous. There was, was like this dude, and everyone just p- started performing. Yeah, on that one picture, it was you uh, had like millions of dollars worth of talent on one, one stage, stage performing for free. Well, kind of. <laughs> He's like, well, come yeah, bottles, a lot of <laughs> bottles went out. <laughs> a lot of bottles went out. A lot of Ace of Spades went out. I don't I, know what happened. I will say, you know, it's A lot fun. of effing vodka. <laughs> <laughs> lots, <laughs> lots of effing vodka. No, uh, well, you know, a, a lot of those things, there were more chess pieces to make all that happen. Yeah, so how does, does that happen? You know. And how does, like, so that they, didn't happen spontaneously. It was kind of planned. It, I mean, it was spontaneous for some people. You, you know, sometimes you kind of, you kind of move the, the obstacle course, hoping they'll go left and right, and then it works out. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that uh, that's also part of the job. You know, even if you're a DJ, right, and the act shows up, you want to have a create an organic enough rapport that they might, you know, right. do some impromptu shit. Yeah. So right, right. I think that's also the power of live music and hip hop versus an electronic DJ, right? Because yeah. what can Tiesto come into the booth with another DJ do? You know, you can only yeah. do so much, right? right? So another act comes in, all of a sudden people, you know, sometimes we don't even care who the other act, they just see an extra person, they're like, oh my God, you know? Mm-hmm. So, but for Mayweather, everybody was here, right? But so, is, it, is it one of those things where like, all right, if we bring this one dude, that everyone's going to follow that one dude? It's like domino effect? I think you hope that. I think yeah. I think when it's like New Year's Eve or Super Bowl or, you know, the fight weekend. I remember when I was a kid and, and there was a picture of like Jay-Z, Diddy, and 50 at Tao. And, yeah. I, you know, and, and I was in Utah running the little club and I was like, oh, wow, you know, I wish. But, you know, and that night was uh, Buster Rhymes, Akon, 50 Cent, Chris, uh, Brown. Chris Brown, Tyga, Fab, uh, Fab um, Jada Kiss probably. Was Usher there too? Uh, I don't know if Usher was on stage. Uh, but it was crazy. Westbrook Trey, was Trey on songs, stage. Trey, was, Trey Songs was Jesus. there too. Dude, that's, come on, man. That's and, nuts. And it was like, play this i mean it was and it was very organic it was it was awesome and at the time i think it was actually chris's birthday we had just signed chris to a residency yeah, yeah. which was a big deal for him at the time because a lot of people weren't they were staring from him they, were still they, they weren't yeah. sure and i think that uh, it looked like the most fu- it was like i, think I wanted like- to just be there because it just looked like <laughs> like everyone on stage looked happy it was dope You're and right, you've never did. seen a group of rappers together like happy they were they were like, popping fun. bottles it's true and like yo and motherfuckers singing other motherfuckers songs yeah yeah i think and there was like a picture of like akon like a little kid on buster rhymes shoulder and buster rhymes is like rapping and like jumping and you know it just it was like crazy. that was it, may of 2015 yeah, right? it was, yeah. that was that was i think that was one of the first times where for a Mayweather fight, yeah, there was something to do that was revolving around hip hop, right? Yeah, right. And that's, that before it wasn't that way for, and, for and, Mayweather. Like you, people would come out here and really didn't know what to do, so they had a destination at that point. And I think the that Mayweather weekend is when we were like, okay, we 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 did it. We're this is we're comfortable. Mm-hmm. We're not afraid. We can do well, this. There's a market. There's a demand yeah. for it, and we can make I mean? it. And we can make it work. Yeah. Meaning, yeah. you know, listen. Uh, Hennessy and vodka are different drinks, right? So right. Yeah. it's a different drunk. It's a different. It's a different, yeah. you know, response. And so, yeah. Uh, I, 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 is, that a, is that a fact? I mean, I don't know. I don't so. I, that's why I don't drink. You that's why I try not like, to drink. You just said it like you did a lot of research. Like you just read some shit about that. I mean, I didn't. I, think, re- I didn't read anything, but there definitely was some experiential research along the way. Yeah. Between dark and light, I'm a much happy tequila guy, and you know. And to see you might it's, you feel compelled to you know anyway so that's it. <laughs> but, but I think well there's I, a thing called Henny Dick so yeah you know, you know I mean it's whiskey dick yeah so it's Henny Dick I don't know dick. about that I've never had this going a direction I wasn't I've never to go. had I yeah I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been like yo man. I was fucked up last night, but I wasn't Hennessy drunk last night. No, I listen, like I, I will say that. I, <laughs> I know, wasn't Hennessy drunk. I, I'm, I'm Greek, so, you know, it's in our, our genes to break stuff. Like, we yeah, yeah. Greek dance and break plates. So, mm-hmm. uh, I, to me, Henny's like a more like, a, let's break something. You know, it's like I feel a little more. I uh, feel you. Uh, you know, the other, but, uh, when I drink tequila, I'm like, ah, I kind of talked too much last night, you know. So, but anyways, I, I was yeah, making yeah. a joke, but I, I think. 
I think that after trust that, me, this is a normal thing in a podcast where we just go off on a tangent on yeah. shit like that. So this, you know, great. I'll fit, it's all I'll fit right yeah. in. Yeah, I'll yeah. fit right in. So uh, I think that after the Mayweather weekend, though, you d- we definitely knew, wow, we can make money doing this. Wow, the crowd is gorgeous. Wow, this was a better party than anyone else. Yes, yeah, it and was. I think that's. That, the, even with the weekend, when we did the weekend the first time, you know, we went against the Gettas and the Calvins, but everybody, like, that was the coolest party. You know what I mean? Every, so, like, every industry, every hot industry right. chick was there. Every every DJ was there. Yeah. I think I was lucky to DJ. I was either DJing that night. I think you were, actually. I, I was. I think you were. Yeah, because you you know you you were you were on the you were on the I was shocked the, the ten year Constantine rotation. Come I was, on, I was Park City. <laughs> <laughs> Park City, I, Utah. I, was shocked. I had like five six DJs that you know I turned to for any you know Crooked was one of the guys we yeah. turned to for just about everything you know and so but but um what do you call it I want to know the moving pieces on getting that all coordinated <laughs> all of those rappers there like, um, how does that work I mean you have, you have a great club you have you have a great staff who uh, can coordinate people in and out no 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 I know you're being you're doing that corporate no, I'm, shit I'm again. Not. <laughs> It's a sexy looking club too, I, but, but listen, a lot of clubs are. I know you're are, on the phone yelling at motherfuckers like, "Yo, Fifty is on his way. Get to the fucking door. Yeah, Make sure so, he's in there." And, blah, and, blah, and blah, the blah. time and the timing of all the two, because it's like you know, hey, you got to be here by this time. The guy that's supposed to go on stage goes on stage because it takes forever to get in the club. You know, you don't want to make Fifty and his team and his. Well, they don't wait. So don't wait. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long <laughs> elevator ride. Right, right, right. Check some. I gotta ass. fucking wait. I gotta be like, I'm like, yo, I'm DJing. They're like, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> it, 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 you know, it, it is a process sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But but listen, we you know you gotta you gotta follow the rules and deliver a safe and, and secure experience. Mm-hmm. We all know that in Vegas. But I think that uh, uh, you know the, the 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 best part about it or the hardest part about it is timing it right because you know let's say uh, I think Fifty and Tyga had a song at the time or something, mm-hmm. and yeah. so. You know, you're waiting for 50 to show up. Tiger goes on. You're hoping he gets to the stage by the time that happens. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, there's two guys you want to get on. But, you know, and, and, you know, the beauty about a guy like 50 Cent and, you know, is because once he's there, it's like you don't have to really do the work anymore because he's going to be like, hey, come come on stage. He's going to call him out. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. You have to come on stage. Like, Yeah, no one's going to say no to 50, right? (laughs) I mean, they might. (laughs) He don't give them a lot of (laughs) options, though. He's going to break their shit. He's going to break their balls, though, if they don't come on stage. We did a billboard party. It was the billboard after party, and 50 did the party. It was 50 and Luda together, actually. Uh Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, whatever, the Kardashians were there or whatever. You know, everybody from billboard came, and, and, you know, Wiz and Ty, at the time, Wiz and Ty had to deal with Tao, and you know, and literally, 50, yeah, they were like, No, 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 I can't. And 50's like, No, I need you up here. I need you. 50 put anyone who was, in, you know, would have made the night a little better for the, they were on stage that yeah. night. They had no choice. The, the girls, the Kardashian, <laughs> their assistants, the Ty Dollar, Wiz, uh, they were, they didn't want to perform. They ended up performing. So, you know, really, he, he's funny like that. He'll, he'll look in the crowd, he'll find the person that, you know. Mm-hmm. He'll make the experience happen. Yeah. You know, so. is, do you, is he still on the contract at Dre's? Um, he he's still uh, an artist that we work with uh, okay. uh, all the time, and uh, you know we we've had a long standing relationship. Uh, you know, Fifty is one of my favorite artists. Always has been. I think he's uh, as an actual uh, music uh, artist. I think he's underappreciative because uh, he's underappreciated because of you know the the persona I guess that stands in front of him. I'm a big Fifty fan, and just as a as a guy, he just, he's a great guy. He's very nice, very, very courteous in person, very engaging, uh, easy to work with, just mm-hmm. every, all about, all around one of my favorite people in the business. Who's, who's your favorite artist? Uh, just at, period or like? It, like that's that's performed at Dre's. I mean, I, I don't know that I could say. I, you can't say I it. Doubt, you can say the number one. No, I don't even mean like, because I'm not supposed to. I just, I, you know, I really do like it, a lot of the artists we work with for different reasons, you know? And, I, you know, I mentioned Chris. You know, Chris is as close to like a, a Michael Jackson talent, you know, that, you yeah. know, because all of us, it's weird, right? Like you're in a bubble, but, you know, when you're young, you know, all this stuff was on TV or some other shit. And, you know, now it's kind of commonplace for us. But, you know, to be around Chris, you know, today in some ways is like being around Michael and Prince 20 years ago, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's our version of it. So, mm-hmm. you know, and and to me, the weekend, you know, was uh, to this day is it, just musically one of the most impressive you know, uh, artists, singers, I, you know, it's, it's such a unique, original sound they've been able to curate and yeah. create. The mm-hmm. first time I heard that, you know, when there was like a mixtape link, I was like, well, you know, what the fuck is it? You know, I never heard anything rumors. like it. So uh, I think creatively, you know, maybe he's one of my favorite artists, Chris, Future, uh, you know, I mentioned 50, Nas is always, you know, to me is 
you know, one of the greatest ever at everything. So, you know. Another figure that had been mentioned on this podcast a lot had been Sean Christie. And in episode 110, Sean was the president of events and nightlife for MGM. And he came on the show just a couple of days after the closing of Chaos Nightclub, a huge venue here in Las Vegas. And while a lot of people in nightlife made memes and rejoiced in the closing of Chaos, Sean shared his own opinion on the situation. I'm not here to really promote anything, but it ties in nicely in terms mm -hmm. of talking yeah. about some of the fun things. Mm -hmm. And then it just so happened that, you know, it fell on the day after Chaos closed, which again, you know, the other interesting thing is, is in night life and night clubs, even if I'm so friendly with Jason Strauss and Noah Tepperberg and mm -hmm. Dave Grupman yeah. Yeah. and all the people that we compete against, you know, so the thing is, is you want to win, but what strikes me is really over the past couple of days is I find it, you know, really the great things about Twitter and Instagram, you know, so you can see great places and hear great DJs and see great design mm -hmm. and kind of peek behind the curtain on the hard, hottest mm -hmm. parties and yeah. hotels. Right. Mm -hmm. I love that part about it, but actually what I don't like about it is, you know, there's all these people who literally Thanksgiving is two weeks away. They have families, mm -hmm. Christmas and the holidays are right here and the new year's come and thankfully like pool clubs are doing their auditions soon and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But honest to God, it really disheartens me when I would rather rally so two things I'd rather rally around the people at chaos that lost their jobs mm -hmm. yeah. by the way everyone's sitting there saying hey you know these guys walked around beating their chest and saying how great they were and they got the new stuff well what the hell are they supposed to do that as a promoter you're supposed to go out and say hey come to my place we built something really cool and great mm -hmm. yeah. some people who are, are skilled and have been around a long time know how to do it in a way that is probably more easily digestible so you don't look like a douche mm. or right. come across yeah. poorly or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But at the end of the day, who cares? I mean, the thing is, is that I don't want to attack people because they took a chance on something, by the way, that is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. It just didn't work out. I mean, that nightclub, even though I just got through telling you that there's nothing new, mm -hmm. I'll tell you, it's one of the best nightclubs in the city for sure, meaning the way it looks, the way it feels. And the pool, again, that statue I thought was a huge, you know, uh, kind of ballsy move to put that giant piece of art. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so for me, you know, big swings, big misses sometimes. Yeah. But again, yeah. I go back to the idea that's a home run. So my only point is, is I just wish this community in general and in Las Vegas would more rally around the people that lost their job than take the opportunity to make memes yeah. about, you know, whatever they're doing at chaos and all the people who are there and all that stuff. I'll tell you what, I think that's total bullshit. Mm -hmm. And I just wish that, and again, I'm not sitting here on my high horse, but again, if you have a friend that has a family, I got a 14 year old daughter and they lose their job before the holidays and it's not their fault. And by the way, it's no one's fault. Mm -hmm. It's really no one's fault. They just have a missed business opportunity that didn't work out. But instead of, you know, pounding on these people that whether they're at the top or they're a waitress or whatever, you know what? I wish people had more empathy and sympathy for those people because whether it's the holidays, which is two weeks away, mm -hmm. imagine being unemployed and now not having a paycheck and it's Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And again, that's no one's fault. It was a, it was a missed opportunity. So my point on the day after the chaos closes is that, you know, I just wish that people would have a little bit, you know, would feel a little bit, uh, and rally around all the people that work there, including the people that were beating their chest saying they were going to be the best. Yeah, yeah. If you're not trying to be the best, you're not trying hard enough. That is a fact. They say there's two sides to every story. And while the guys had Sean Christie on the show, they had to ask him about an event that he was a part of. 
This made global national news. DJ Jazzy Jeff kicked off stage mid-set during a DJ AM tribute event in Las Vegas. And before we hear Sean's side, we're going to head to episode 17 where Shecky Green recalls his version of events of that night. There was a very famous scene where DJ Jazzy Jeff got pulled. Do you remember that story? Je- you yeah. know, Dean Miles was asking. Yeah, that was, that was the question. That, that's the question you're going to ask. <laughs> yeah, okay. but thanks for even bringing that up. It yeah. made it a lot easier. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, he, that was, was, he was nervous to ask about that. No, yeah. that, was, that was definitely <clears throat> the, the, the most frustrating moment in my win experience that night, for sure. Because... What happened was is, and I'll be totally honest in telling the story, and and I'm friends with many people involved. Okay, basically, Jazzy Jeff. It was an AM tribute night, so there was mm-hmm. a lot of people there wearing AM shirts. I was there that night, yeah. And wearing there was posters and there was like signs and there was everything. It was AM night, and it wasn't too long after he died. It was like maybe a year after he died. Mm-hmm. I think it was one year later. Yeah, I think it was the one year anniversary. I think so too. Yeah, and. <clears throat> Jazzy Jeff was the headliner, and there were other DJs opening, and it was like it was people that knew him. So it was, I think, it was like Vice, and it was um, Dig Dug. Dig probably, Dug. Yeah. It was Dig Dug, and I think Justin Hoffman even played a little bit, mm-hmm. and there was some <laughs> other people. And Milo, Milo was there. Yeah. yeah, and so then Jazzy Jeff comes on, and his set for whatever reason is low energy. Now I'll be totally honest, it wasn't a high energy set. He was playing. I remember he was playing genuine. My Pony remix, some remix of My Pony, but it was slow. It was that's a slow song actually, uh-huh. and um, and I remember like it was it, the, okay. The most some of the crowd were fine, you know, like probably sixty percent of the crowd normal, but there was a, a little bit of antsiness because this was now we're starting to get into the EDM era. Right. So hearing that sounded now that starts to sound like old. it doesn't fit. Yeah, yeah, it just sounded old. It sounds right, old. Right. And it sounds slow. The funny thing is he could do that set now and it would <laughs> but, be even more relevant now because yeah. everyone's like obsessed with the 90s and like, yeah. you know, early yeah. 2000 records, you know. So basically, long story short is that I'm asked to pull Jazzy Jeff and I said, no, I would not do it. And they were like, if you don't pull Jazzy Jeff, we're going to do it. And I was like, well, I'm not doing it. So they sent the security over oh, shit. to some big security guy who doesn't know anything, and honestly, and I'm going to throw him under the bus, Mm -hmm. he was, I mean, he can say he was just following orders, which he was, okay? He goes over with the security, and and I was standing helplessly, and they watch, and they pull Jazzy Jeff. They make him stop. They make him stop DJing, and he has to leave, and they make him kind of leave the venue even, and it was so embarrassing. He was there to pay tribute to AM. Like, it was an AM party, and, like, it's Jazzy Jeff, you know? And it was, like, and then that story got out. Right. And people started to, it made it to, like, page six, New York Post, and places like that. And it became a story. But then, if you remember, he also got pulled somewhere else, like, another oh, around Kansas. that same time. Wasn't mm-hmm. it around Z Trip or something? Yeah, it was in Kansas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It was around the same time, was it? 2010. Really? Yeah, around the same time he got pulled somewhere else. So like it became, it, it, in a weird way, it became a story about Jazzy Jeff. Like, why does he keep getting pulled, you know? And I don't know yeah. why. I mean, the, in that case, I, the reason was we had entered the EDM era. It was the first year of the EDM era. And it was very frustrating. And, and yeah. I Do mean, you, I mean, two things. Well, it, it was definitely a sign of like something is going wrong when you're pulling Jazzy Jeff, right? <laughs> That's, if you, and it's like two signs. It's like two signs of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It happened like like you said, like back to back almost. And then and Kansas was because he w- he was playing a uh, hip hop and like a rock bar. It was mall. a festival. Yeah, it was. Yeah, like it was a festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was an outdoor festival with, with Z Trip. And Z Trip was actually embarrassed about it. I yeah, Z Trip was like, I played Bone Thugs and stuff like that, and they didn't pull me. But I I want to say. Did you maybe regret that maybe you should have said it like instead of had the security come in? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I because I mean, l- luckily, I think my friendship with him survived. Like, but it was it, at, for a while. Yeah, I was really I regretted a lot of things about it. I mean, but I also didn't want to be the one. No, I was like, no, I'm not. I've known Jazzy Jeff before I knew the win. Right. I knew Jazzy Jeff a little bit in Philly in the 80s. You know what I mean? So I was 
I'm go, I go back further with him than I do with the win guys. So I'm not going to jeopardize that for someone's opinion about music, you know. And the truth was, he was playing a slow tempo. Like it wasn't the right but, choice. Like it was. Uh, all right. So, but but the right thing. <laughs> right. Go. You're gonna say. No, I was there that night. Yeah. He was doing a set that he usually does. Right. It does. It wasn't anything different. It was a jazzy did he, jazz did set. Did he have uh, mad skills on no, the mic with him? He, no, I, he I don't didn't. think he was there that night. No. Fuck. You that know, probably probably suffered because of that a little bit. Could he, have been. Yeah. He um he's so technical, and I think he needs that mad skills there just to great MC. By no way. interact with the crowd. Yeah, he doesn't really yeah. talk at all. He doesn't yeah. interact, yeah. and he's so technical. Like he's doing such technical shit mm-hmm. that yeah, he's very serious. You know what right. I mean? Yes. And it's just uh, yeah. Actually, I, you know what? Now that I remember to 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 tell the whole story, I did actually go. Initially, I did go, but I didn't talk to him. I talked to his manager there, uh-huh. and I said, hey, man, they're starting to beef about the music not not being the right, you know, you got to pick up the energy. And he's like, you want me to tell him to pick up the tempo? And I was like, yes, please, tell him to pick up the tempo. So I did actually attempt to intervene right. with before the real shit hit the fan. Yeah. I tried to, I tried to kind of like preempt the bad thing from happening. But he did tell him. But for whatever reason, it didn't happen fast enough or whatever. They, you know you know how they are. They want the next they, – they want to change something. They want it instantly. They want that record right now. Yeah. He was – he's he's a skillful DJ who's trying to build up to something. <laughs> he's trying yeah. to transition from yeah. like, yeah. yeah. He's not going to throw in some song like just because some guy in a suit tells him to play I, it. I'm going to tell you something. Transitioning from Pony BPMs, which yeah. is like what, like 80, 80 75? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. In that Clip the Road podcast, bleep the name of the person – that Shecky held responsible for deciding to kick DJ Jazzy Jeff off of the stage. But Sean Christie reveals his decision making and whether he believes it was the right or wrong thing to do. We, I, I've never gotten a clear story of what happened with Jazzy Jeff. Yeah. And I just wanted to hear it from you. Sure. So, I mean, the long story short, I think that that is also an instance of, you know, me in my immaturity, meaning that I used to be so quick to, uh, you know, act. And and actually the truth was, I didn't ever care who it was, was the truth. And so the thing is, is obviously, you know, kind of looking back on my career, that was a regrettable moment. But really it was a thing between Sheck and I in the sense that my expectation going into that evening, because if, uh, if you remember, that was in EDM time. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so the way I remember it, and again, it's all good. Sheck and I are good. You know, we had a lot of angst over it. You know, I've apologized for it. And, and actually, it's one of the most regrettable moments in my career in terms of who cares? I should have just gone home. But at the end of the day, my expectation of that evening was that there was going to be ED, you know, that it, the format was going to be kept intact, which, by the way, maybe dumb of me to think that you know somebody who does a certain thing is going to adapt or whatever but going into that night that was actually my expectation Uh and so i had felt like it was it had been made crystal clear before we did the booking because you know i i was just i was like look i I don't want to do it unless it's going to be unless it's going to be that right and so that was my recollection of that evening and then what ended up happening was, is it wasn't that. And I'd also said to Sheck, which again, was just really unfortunate because, you know, the best DJ I've ever heard in my entire life is DJ AM. It's not even, you know, it's just, he was the best. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm trying to put in context, which I'll bring it full circle, is trying to put anybody else even in kind of second place I mean, there have been nights where I had maybe because of the crowd and the energy and the evening and stuff like that, maybe, you know, there have been moments that are that exciting. But in terms of a DJ, I had really so the unfortunate part of that that, about that night was it was because AM had passed and obviously a huge fan. But. I used to have a thing where I would snap and it was just visceral and it's really taken me a really long time to be much more centered. And I, th- I think those things, not to get too deep, but as I work on myself as an adult and I meditate and I read and 
uh, you know, I have a better understanding about life in general. Mm -hmm. uh, but at that moment, when my expectation for the DJ, and, and again, I had felt like it was clear, had not been met, I was just like, look, Sheck, basically, if it's not going to happen and we're not going to do this, I'm, or whoever, I think it was Shecky, you know, um, if, if X doesn't start happening, it is what it is, and he's going to have to come off. Right. Mm. And so that's what ended up happening, is he ended up coming off, and he handled it like a gentleman. Uh, by the way, he wasn't thrown out by the security of the club or anything like that. <laughs> just oh, yeah. <laughs> that's a myth. That, that was a myth. That part was a myth. The part that is correct was that I threw him out. Uh -huh. And, you know, the next day, there was such kind of upheaval about it, rightfully so. And it wasn't until the next day that I realized what I had done. And I was kind of like, oh, my God. Like, And so what started happening as a result of that, so, Jeff, if you're listening, I apologize. But And then I'm going to bring it back to Jeff, which is that... What I really realized after that was when I'm having a bad night as it relates to the DJ, which of course there are going to be some good and some bad. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more, <laughs> which is in, in my prime of, you know, being so, it's really about being passionate. I'm really passionate yeah. about the <clears throat> DJ and the music and the crowd. If someone's playing something and it's working, I'm in, right? And on that night, actually, it just there was a group of DJs that were digging it and I even got quoted on that. But as I looked out to 4,000 people, it was kind of like, Hey, what, what, what's like going on here? It was, it, it was off. Right. And that was my fault, not anyone else's. So I had one other, I think after that or before, I don't know if Shecky told the story about it with treasure fingers. No, no. no. So the interesting thing right. was is treasure fingers. It's so stupid. And again, uh, I was totally 100% at fault, just like I was at fault with Jeff. Treasure Fingers, <laughs> I had never heard Barbara Streisand. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So all of a sudden I hear, do, 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 do. <laughs> Barbara Streisand. <laughs> and I'm looking at it. That's a duck sauce record. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Duck sauce. Yeah. Who, by the way, then I was the only one who booked them. I, I booked them and I paid $12,000 for the duck to come out. <laughs> and I had duck sauce at Surrender. Because I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. But before anybody knew what it was, I, and finally, I had had, maybe you were there too, or maybe it was more Sheck, but I had had a run of the format because when EDM came out, we were still trying to get people to play it consistently. And we'd have DJs come in mm -hmm. and do like an open format set. And I was like, look, it's not, it's an EDM club. You're either going to play it or not. Everybody would say yes. And then I think that, if your skill set is X, you know, you go back to maybe what you feel good about because you know how to rock a party. Yeah. So I had had a bunch of those instances where I had just gotten fed up. So Treasure Fingers, the very first song, he drops bar uh, oh, duck, duck Sauce, and I threw him off. He didn't even get to the end of the song, and I threw him off too. <laughs> and I was just basically saying to everybody, and again, it's all regrettable, but... I was saying to everybody, like, look, if you're not going to play the format, you know, <laughs> yeah. Sheriff Sean's going to come and throw you off. <laughs> yeah. and, and again, I'm just saying that. And again, all those things are stupidity. And what I learned out of all that stuff is if I'm having a bad night, you know what? It's all ego. And it's all my ego. And actually, what I need to do is just go home and restart the day. Because at the end of the day, the DJ is an artist. And so... There has to be creative freedom and you know ability to express yourself. Mm -hmm. And why am I the arbiter of that? I'm the arbiter because I'm the you know I'm the operator of the club, and I've you know generally speaking been right. But now when I have bad nights, actually, and I, I've had some at on the record as well, where I literally, you know, someone I thought someone was going to be good, mm -hmm. and they just really were kind of dropping an egg, and I was like, you know, oh God, uh, I've learned to go home. And so over the years now, what I do is I just, I fall back on that and I go home. But, you know, as I said, the, the Jazzy Jeff thing of everything in my 20 year career is probably my most regrettable and the thing that is hard for me to talk about, but it is what it is. The past yeah. is the past. And then now coming full circle, the best night that I've ever had at on the record was Jazzy Jeff. <laughs> I mean, honest to God, he played on uh, on a Saturday in like June. 
Mm-hmm. Around, yeah, June 18th, I think. Yep, so Saturday June, in June. June 19th or something. And it was, it was m- like magic. And I was just like, wow, can, can you believe Full things? circle. And the other great part was is Shecky was there hanging out, and I was just like, you know what? This kind of feels like you know, putting a bad incident behind. And actually, I almost felt like that night, I, I almost felt like I had to go up to Jeff and like acknowledge it in some way. Mm-hmm. But it, I was like, it's, it's not appropriate, you know? And then I was just thinking to myself, you know what, it was... I think anybody who was there, I don't know who was there, but uh, for everybody, for anybody who was there, you know, I was kind of thinking to myself, this is a better way to end it. Like this is the right. appropriate way yeah. to yeah. put this, yeah, you know, as, yeah. a, as a bad incident yeah. and yeah. bad chapter in my career. So again, you know, always apologize. And the other funny part was, is, you know, we had Questlove here and yeah. I just remember him blasting me on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, you know, he didn't know who I was calling me like whatever this like loser club promoter, you know, just and everybody was blasting me. And by the way, you know, probably deservedly so. And then I remember uh, I got called to the president of Wynn's office at that time and basically being like, like, what happened? Mm-hmm. Like, how is this like a major news story? It yeah. had gone viral on yeah. Twitter yes. Uh, yes, and all that stuff. And I was, I, I actually didn't understand the power of social media mm-hmm. until Especially that day. It was just the beginning, actually. Yeah. It was yeah. the beginning yeah, of Twitter. Yeah. 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 Next yeah. thing I knew, I woke up and Your really I was just like, wait, what, what's going on? I mean, <laughs> yes, it was horrible and all that stuff, but I, I don't remember it being like, you know, I took nine security guards and I like threw Jazzy Jeff out of the club or anything like that. Like I remember Fresh it Prince being, of yeah. It, it, <laughs> again, it was a bad situation, which again was a hundred percent my fault. But actually, that was one of the days where I realized the power of social media because I was. It seemed like the entire world, and then I I knew because that was when Cascade was doing his party, uh-huh. and I remember him texting me and i get a text from cascade being like it all it said was hey what happened last night oh, and i'm looking at it and i'm like i was like question mark I'm like what do you mean yeah he's like jazzy jeff question mark and i was like you know i was just like and and you know so my response was whatever it was but i'm like how did you like see about this he's yeah. like like dude like you know twitter like cap <laughs> capital twitter or something and i was like oh my god you know like everybody knows you know he's like oh yeah like everybody's like talking about it i'm like oh boy i'm gonna go hide for a few days (laughs) and then i actually ended up r.i.p who i loved robin leach too that night i actually had to do an interview with robin leach Mm -hmm. and kind of try to set the record straight which also came out bad you know when i look even back on uh that interview that i did with robin which wasn't anything you know i didn't say anything bad i I put my spin on it if you will which was which was honestly just, which was exactly what I just told you. Probably, if you look it up and you were to put Las Vegas Sun, Robin Lee, Sean Christie, that type of thing, uh-huh. and uh, you know, more important than that, I, meaning me, I screwed up that AM memorial, and I was such a diehard fan of his, and so the thing, it really wasn't even about Jeff. It was more about that I had, you know, kind of screwed that up. Um, and I still have the T-shirt from that night that we did. I for still it. have that T-shirt yeah. as well. I still have it too, mm-hmm. and it's in my closet. And actually, every time I look at it, I'm like, I think to myself, number one, I try not to forget about it because I want it to be a lesson. To again, that's all ego. Yeah. I mean, that's all ego. That's on me. So regardless of even the conversations that I did have with Shecky about that evening, who cares? Like it was about something else and I made it about me. And so that was one of the best lessons that came at the expense of a lot of people that were having a tough time with something. Yeah. And so the idea that I did that 10 years later, I sit here and it's embarrassing. It's the first time I've ever talked about it. Oh, I appreciate it. No, no, all good. Because actually I'm glad I'm talking about it. Uh, not, you know, not to say that's right. I, I feel like I can only really talk about it because you know, and again, if, if, if Jeff were to hate me forever, I would get it. You know, I, I, we never talked about it, but because he came here, he played, it was like one of the best nights ever. I kind of feel licensed 10 years later to kind of talk about it <laughs> yeah. and, and to say, and to also say that it, you know, 
uh, 100% my fault, regardless of anything. Well, he posted on Instagram yeah. about that night, and he had a, he had a really good... Was this recently or after? Like the, after, day after like the, the day after he did on the record. Yeah, yeah the and right like, party with the wrong whatever that... What did he say? And he's, it was actually touching. He oh, said, really I've always good. had a... You know, I've had a rocky relationship with Las Vegas. Right. And yes, that's and, right. But on the record, does it right? You know, this oh, you're is saying the after the on the record? Yeah. After after the, after oh, the yeah, record, I saw yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was which really was great. Good. No, but the, nice, the, yeah. the tweet that came right after the incident. The excess, yeah. W- oh, the surrender incident. The surrender, yeah. Yeah, it was like, it was like you know, the, the right party with the wrong or something. Like, like he had said something that was like five words, and I, I saw it, and I was like, ugh. I was like, he's <laughs> basically inferring. It was the right thing at the wrong place. And so mm. when I read the uh, post on the record uh, post that right. had said, you know, this was like kind of the first time he'd been back. I was happy that in some way I was a part of that yeah. mm-hmm. because I had also felt responsible for the idea that, you know, for all that time, that incident, y- you know, had cast a shadow over, by the way, myself in terms of a lot of DJs and, and my relationships with them. And actually, to tell you the truth, checking my relationship for a bit of time after that, you know, I don't know how long, but there was a period of time where it damaged my relationship. So even on a personal level, I was really disappointed in myself as it related to me, you know, because Shecky's one of my best friends in the entire world. He's like a brother. Mm-hmm. And so the idea, like, would I do that to my brother? Yeah. No. Yeah. Why did I do it to Shecky? But again, in the moment, I just used to have a hair trigger, and I swear it didn't matter who it was. I mean, it could be, you know, whoever or whoever. I just, it was, it just was, you know, and it took all these years to mature and to realize that, again, who the hell am I? I mean, it's about, it's ego. So I try to put the ego, and as, um, you know, to end on a, on a note reflecting on AM, which he would always say, which in his Twitter, which he would say, you know, starve the ego, feed the soul. Yeah. You know, so RIP DJ AM. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Avicii. This has been the Best of the Road podcast, volume three, Inside the Industry. I'm your host, Nudia. It's been nice to be here without the guys, but I'm not going to lie. I do miss them. We'll all be back next week with a brand new episode. In the meantime, I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving and we'll see you then. If you want to watch more episodes from Road Podcasts, click either links on the left or the right. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page and get updated on new uploads throughout the week. Peace.